Good afternoon. My purposes in this talk are twofold. First, to discuss co-design as a key route to discovery research, the kind of research that one might associate with the Office of Basic Energy Sciences. Second, to speculate on opportunities for AI to enhance co-design, and hence to enhance discovery research. The chain of ideas that I plan to run through with you today is outlined here. The first idea is that evolution, particularly techno-scientific evolution, isn't always continuous. Sometimes it's discontinuous. The second idea is that surprise is a key characteristic of those techno-scientific discontinuities. The third idea is that there is a kind of design that one might call amodular, and this kind of design is a key route to surprise. The fourth idea is that amodular design is really what we mean by co-design, and that both are what might just be called interdisciplinary research. The fifth idea is that interdisciplinary research isn't easy and has benefited throughout history from the development of general purpose tools, with AI being the latest and perhaps ultimately among the most important. The sixth idea is that in the short run, we might look forward to AI augmenting how humans do co-design and discovery research, what might be called augmented co-design. The seventh idea is that in the fantastical long run, we might look forward to AI doing some aspects of co-design and discovery research all by itself, what we might call virtual co-design. Okay, let's start with evolution. Here the point I want to make is that evolution usually proceeds continuously, but every once in a while it experiences discontinuities. Here on the left is an example from biology, dinosaur evolution. The dinosaur on the left is a velociraptor. Like virtually all living things, the velociraptor is highly modularized. It has all sorts of organs, just like we have, a heart, lungs, stomach, liver, etc. These organs interact in particular ways, the lungs, for example, extract oxygen from the atmosphere and transfer it into the bloodstream and release carbon dioxide from the bloodstream into the atmosphere. Importantly, the other organs of the dinosaur don't care how the lungs perform their function, so long as the lungs perform it. If the lungs figure out a different way of extracting oxygen from the atmosphere, then the other modules are happy, so long as they continue to get oxygenated blood. Every once in a while, however, a discontinuous change occurs, one that alters even the function of a module. Feathers are an example. The velociraptor used the thermal properties of feathers for thermal regulation and the colors of feathers to attract mates, so feathers evolved to fulfill those functions. But at some point, feathers were co-opted for a new function, flight, as illustrated by the Archaeopteryx on the right. Suddenly, everything changed for feathers. Feathers now needed to be reshaped to fulfill the new function of flight. Not only that, even the function of flight was unclear. What exactly was optimal for flight? Flying fast, flying high, swooping, gliding? The establishment of feathers and flight as a new functional pair was a discontinuous event one which opened up new white space for subsequent more continuous evolution, with the ultimate result being, of course, the modern bird. Moreover, technoscientific evolution is no different. Here on the right, I show a 200-year history of the power conversion efficiency of various lighting technologies. I've drawn four technologies, each representing a discontinuity from its predecessor. Incandescent lighting was based on a totally different energy source, electricity, than fire. Discharge lighting was based on a totally different physical phenomenon than incandescent lighting, plasma excitation of mercury rather than black body radiation. And solid state lighting is based, of course, on electron hole pair recombination 
in semiconductors, yet another completely different physical phenomenon. Interestingly, at the point of discontinuity, the new technology is not necessarily better than the old technology. Incandescent lighting had about the same power conversion efficiency as fire when it first appeared. Solid-state lighting had worse power conversion efficiency than both incandescent and discharged lighting when it first appeared. But the discontinuities provided new white space for further evolution that eventually enabled much higher power conversion efficiencies, just like feathers for flight provided new white space that eventually enabled birds. The main point I want to make with this slide, and perhaps it's an obvious one, is that discontinuities in evolution are very important. This is not to dismiss the more continuous progress that is made in between this, these discontinuities, which is also very important, but it is, the, it is the discontinuities that open up the white space for the subsequent continuous progress. Let's now consider the nature of these discontinuities, particularly for our, for our interest at this workshop, technoscientific evolution. What is the essential feature of a technoscientific techno discontinuity? The essential feature is that it couldn't have been predicted within the knowledge domain itself. If it could have been predicted within that knowledge domain, if it were consistent with the conventional wisdom of that knowledge domain, then the change would be more continuous and less discontinuous. In other words, the essential feature of a technoscientific discontinuity is that conventional wisdom is surprised. To illustrate more concretely what we mean by that, here on the left I show a diagram from some recent work on the science of creativity that illustrates how some potential new knowledge might be viewed as surprising or not. The y-axis is the utility of the, of the potential new knowledge. The x-axis is the perceived probability of the utility of the potential new knowledge. The left side of the diagram illustrates perceived probability, probability distributions over utility according to current conventional wisdom. I've sketched two distributions. For the upper one in blue, Current conventional wisdom perceives the potential new knowledge to have a relatively high utility. For the lower one in red, current conventional wisdom perceives the potential new knowledge to have a relatively low utility. The right side of the diagram illustrates perceived probability distributions over utility according to revised conventional wisdom, revised after the potential new knowledge has played out in the techno-scientific community. I've sketched here also two distributions. For the upper one in blue, revised conventional wisdom perceives the potential new knowledge to have a relatively high utility. For the lower one in red, revised conventional wisdom perceives the potential new knowledge to have a relatively low utility. Going from left to right, from current to revised conventional wisdom, there are four permutations. Two of those four permutations go straight across to the right. They confirm rather than disconfirm conventional wisdom. One type is at the bottom, red going to red. Conventional wisdom didn't believe the potential new knowledge would be useful, and it turns out it wasn't useful. Conventional wisdom's disbelief was confirmed. Another type is at the top, blue going to blue. Conventional wisdom believed the potential new knowledge would be useful, and it turns out it was useful. Conventional wisdom's belief was confirmed. The other two of the four permutations go diagonally up or down. They disconfirm rather than confirm conventional wisdom. One type goes diagonally downwards, blue to red. Conventional wisdom believed the potential new knowledge would be useful but it turns out it wasn't useful. Conventional wisdom was disconfirmed. A final type goes diagonally upwards, red to blue. Conventional wisdom didn't believe the potential new knowledge would be useful, and it turns out it was useful. Conventional wisdom again was disconfirmed. 
it is this last permutation, the one that combines surprise and utility, that is the epitome of creativity. The potential new knowledge is useful. That's, of course, important. But just as important, the usefulness of the potential new knowledge was surprising. Conventional wisdom mispredicted the utility and thus must be revised. This is exactly what discovery research, the kind we might associate with the Office of Basic Energy Science, aims for, to discover new knowledge that goes beyond what conventional wisdom can predict, beyond what conventional wisdom can even imagine. It is like these monkeys on the right. Evolving into humans is beyond what they can imagine. Okay, we've talked about the importance of surprise. How would one go about looking for surprise? Well, of course, one can't know where to look. We don't know what we don't know. But one can know where not to look, and where not to look is where conventional wisdom is mature. What do I mean by mature? Here I show a sequence, again from the history of lighting. Incandescent lighting technology, having just surprised fire-based lighting, begins in its early stage, evolves to a mature stage, then, it is, then is itself surprised by solid-state lighting technology, which then begins in its early stage. For early stage incandescent lighting on the left, you see a number of possible incandescent lamps. There is one universal feature of all these lamps, a filament of some kind encased in an evacuated glass bulb. But other than that, every other feature is fair game to be modified. What material the filament is, the filament is made of, how the filament is shaped, how the electrical contacts are made, what voltages and currents are used, how the bulb is even shaped. All these things were fair game to be modified. In the language of complex adaptive systems, one would say early stage incandescent lamps were not very modularized, and the protocols governing the interfaces between modules were very flexible. For mature stage incandescent lighting in the middle, you see a modern incandescent lamp. In the language of complex adaptive systems, one would say that the modern incandescent lamp is highly modularized, and the protocols governing the interface between modules are very inflexible. With some outliers, pretty much all filaments are designed to have electrical resistances appropriate for operation at 110 volts. The size and shape of the glass bulb is such as to accommodate common lighting fixtures. And the Edison socket is among the most ubiquitous and rigid of all electrical connection protocols. For early stage solid state lighting on the right, you see a solid state lighting chip from LumiLeds, LumiLeds that was a big leap forward for lighting. The chip was flipped over with light extracted out of the roughened back of the device. That seems like a simple change, but it was revolutionary. By not obeying the normal protocol of extracting light out from the top, a new device was created that simultaneously improved light extraction efficiency, contact resistance, and thermal heat sinking. Again, in the language of complex adaptive systems, one would say that these early stage solid state lamps were not very modularized, and the protocols governing the interfaces between modules were very flexible. To give these early stage design methodologies a name, one might call them amodular and protocol disrespecting, as distinguished from mature stage design methodologies that one might call modular and protocol respecting. Amodular design treats all changes within the system as fair game, whereas modular design only allows changes that respect existing protocols. And because modularization and development of protocols is essentially the development and strengthening of conventional wisdom, modular design respects conventional wisdom, while amodular design lies outside of conventional wisdom, hence is a key route to surprise. The more amodular and broad your scope of action, the less you rely on conventional wisdom, 
while the more modular and restricted your scope of action, the more you rely on conventional wisdom. And this is true not just for techno-scientific knowledge, it is true for other kinds of knowledge as well. As Henry Kissinger once said in the realm of politics between nations, when your scope for action is greatest, the knowledge on which you can base this action is always at a minimum. When your knowledge is greatest, the scope for action has often disappeared. Now, in the last slide, I coined the phrase a modular design. The reason I did that was to draw a contrast to modular design. But a modular design, in essence, is what we mean by co-design. Co-design is like a modular it, like a modular design, the disrespecting of protocols between modules, between knowledge domains. Co-design is an anything-goes sort of design in which multiple knowledge domains evolve simultaneously. And when, mu when multiple knowledge domains co-evolve, we call that interdisciplinary research. So co-design is also essentially interdisciplinary research. Note, though, that there are two senses in which one might mean interdisciplinary. To see that, here on the left, I've sketched the microelectronics knowledge hierarchy from the BES basic research needs for microelectronics workshop report. This is, of course, a vertical hierarchy in which knowledge domains lower down in the hierarchy are modules that are made use of by knowledge domains higher up in the hierarchy. Interdisciplinary can mean cutting across this vertical hierarchy. But each level of the hierarchy itself contains many knowledge domains. In materials and chemistry, for example, one might list various materials, polymers, semiconductors, quantum materials, metals, each of which is a vast knowledge domain in and of itself. Interdisciplinary can also mean cutting horizontally across these various knowledge domains within the overarching knowledge domain of materials and chemistry. In other words, there's a two-dimensional space within which one might define an quote-unquote analogic distance, to borrow a phrase from cognitive science, that characterizes the distance between two knowledge domains. Bridging such analogic distances is the key to interdisciplinary research, to co-design, to amodular design, and hence is a key route to surprise and discovery research. Moreover, the likelihood of surprise depends on analogic distance. As illustrated schematically by the surprise curve in green on the right, if analogic distance is short, so one is sticking to one's discipline, the likelihood of discovering something surprising is low because, because one is staying within the confines of conventional wisdom within that discipline. If analogic distance is long, the likelihood of discovering something surprising is also low because a single person has difficulty straddling such different knowledge domains. So there's a sweet spot in analogic distance where the likelihood of surprise is highest. Of course, few of us are lone individuals trying to straddle knowledge domains all on our own. We all the time work together as groups to straddle bigger and bigger analogic distances. A key question then is, can we create and utilize tools for interdisciplinariness that can shift the surprise curve to the right and upwards? The answer is, of course, yes. Tools for humans to better share knowledge and better collaborate as groups have been around for a long time. We might call these general purpose tools for inter interdisciplinary research. Paper and the printing press. The technical journal invented by the Royal Society in England in 1665. The modern research lab invented by Thomas Edison in 1876 the internet and search. All of these and of course many more have profoundly improved how we share knowledge. 
and it isn't just physical tools. Some of you may be aware of the International Network for the Science of Team Science, which is trying to lay a scientific foundation for interdisciplinariness. And connecting now to this workshop, a, a key question is, how might artificial intelligence develop into a powerful new general purpose tool for interdisciplinariness? The idea is not co-designed for the purpose of improving AI, though that is certainly of interest. The, key, the idea is AI for the purpose of improving co-design. My guess is, yes, AI is going to improve, even transform many walks of life. I don't see why it won't transform how we do research as well. Maybe AI will become so routine that, like the recent Oscock report on AI and machine learning suggests, AI won't replace the scientist, but scientists who use AI will, re will replace those who don't. So what I'd like to do in my last two slides is speculate on how AI might become a general purpose tool for interdisciplinary research. I'd like to discuss two kinds of opportunities. In one kind of opportunity, what one might call augmented co-design, AI enhances how humans do co-design. In another kind of opportunity, one, what one might call virtual co-design, AI actually does co-design itself. Okay, let's start with augmented co-design, where co-design is still done by the human, but with AI augmentation. In the spirit of speculation, here are some possibilities. Organized around a divergent, convergent knowledge generation and test framework, similar, similar to the one we used in discussing surprise. One needs to create choices to generate potential new knowledge, then one needs to make choices to subject that potential new knowledge to some kind of test to decide whether to go forward with it or not. AI can, in principle, help in different ways throughout this knowledge generate and test framework. Let's start at the bottom left. AI as divergent thinking catalyst. Can AI, for example, be used to seed humans with new interdisciplinary knowledge combinations. A possible flow is sketched in the graphic at the very top, adapted, adapted from recent work by Mario Kren and Anton Zeilinger. One constructs a network of concepts and how they were connected in a particular year, say 2012. One constructs a set of characteristics of those concepts for 2012 and uses those characteristics to train a neural network to predict how those concepts were connected, especially in new ways. Uh, you know, especially in new ways in a later year, say 2017. Then one constructs a new set of characteristics for 2017 and uses those characteristics to infer how those concepts might be connected in a future year, say 2022. Some of these connections will be new and perhaps these can be used to stimulate human thinking about what new interdisciplinary knowledge combinations might be interesting. Or can AI, for example, be used to seed humans with possible new interdisciplinary collaborators? One could imagine the same flow as the above, except now the nodes of the network aren't concepts, they're people. And AI is predicting AI is predicting which people are likely to become collaborators in the future. If we thought there was a high probability two people would become co collaborators five, five years from now, we could match make them now and perhaps accelerate the process by a few years. Let's move now to the upper left, AI as divergent thinking evaluator. Can AI, for example, measure the degree to which a new knowledge combination is surprising? Could we train a neural network to recognize how surprising past knowledge combinations were and then infer how surprising current knowledge combinations are? This way, if one comes up with a new knowledge combination that one thinks is surprising, but actually 
to the community, it isn't so surprising. That knowledge combination can be set aside. That knowledge combination might be useful in some other context, just not for discovery research. Let's move now to the lower right, AI as convergent thinking catalyst. Let's say a new knowledge combination is proposed. Testing that knowledge combination requires finding humans with the right combination of domain knowledge. Can AI be used to find those humans? Finally, last but not least, let's move to the upper right, AI as convergent thinking evaluator. Convergent thinking is fraught with false negatives and false positives, particularly when one is talking about discovery research. On the false negative side, virtually every really impactful new knowledge was initially considered wrong by conventional wisdom. It took someone's tenacity to keep at it and eventually show that conventional wisdom needed to be revised. Could AI be informed by conventional wisdom but drill further into first principles? Could it then inform the human that even though the new knowledge superficially appears wrong, it actually doesn't violate any fundamental, any fundamental principles and perhaps could be right? Maybe this involves physics-informed neural networks or some other means of drilling down to first principles. On the false positive side, most potential new knowledge is actually incorrect. It might even violate some fundamental principle, but because one doesn't happen to know that principle, one's up, one ends up wasting a few weeks exploring it. Can AI help? Again, perhaps through its own deep understanding of physics, for example, through physics-informed neural networks. Okay, let's now turn to virtual co-design. This is co-design done itself by an AI algorithm. Here, of course, we are starting to border on the fantastical, where AI has become human-like in its ability to be creative. I'm certainly not an AI expert, so I can't speak to all the reasons why this might be difficult for AI to do. But let me mention two, difficult, two difficulties that I find especially interesting. On the left is illustrated one difficulty. Here I've drawn a dot in red of potential new knowledge, special relativity. If that dot were evaluated within the conventional wisdom of Newtonian mechanics, it could easily end up being a false negative, incorrectly evaluated as incorrect. But as it turns out, the central equation of special relativity e equals mc squared explained emerging scientific facts in a completely different knowledge domain, radioactive decay, and that made special relatively much more plausible. Can AI do something like this? To come up with surprise, can AI extrapolate outside the knowledge domain it was trained in? But then to help know whether to believe that surprise or not, can it interpolate across knowledge domains it hasn't been trained in? On the right is illustrated another difficulty, that discovery research can be thought of as a game. The game is to discover something that is true and useful that conventional wisdom doesn't yet know. The competition is to come up with potential new knowledge that conventional wisdom thinks can't be useful, but because the AI is better informed than conventional wisdom, it knows that it could be useful. In a sense, this is a game of arbitrage. The bottom axis of the diagram on the right is the conventional wisdom assessment of the utility of the potential new knowledge. Let's say that guess is low. That means the idea is contrary to conventional wisdom. The left axis is what the informed AI thinks will be the utility of the potential new knowledge. If it's also low, then the informed AI agrees with conventional wisdom. But if it's high, then the informed AI disagrees with conventional wisdom. Why might that be? It might be because the informed AI has some inside knowledge. <clears throat> Maybe the AI has access to a new tool, to a better telescope, 
that conventional wisdom doesn't know about yet. Or maybe the AI has thought through the problem more deeply, down to first principles, than conventional wisdom has. Moreover, the greater the discrepancy between the informed AI and conventional wisdom assessments of utility, the greater the surprise. The potential new knowledge represented by A, B, and C all have the same informed AI assessments of utility, but the potential new knowledge represented by A has the lowest conventional wisdom assessment of utility and therefore has the greatest opportunity for surprise. This is, of course, very similar to what happens in financial markets, where we would call it financial arbitrage. If an, insider's, in, if an inside trader's informed knowledge of the price of an asset is higher than conventional wisdom's knowledge of the price of that asset, then the inside trader can use that to his or her advantage by investing in the asset. Here, in the game of discovery research, we might call this research arbitrage. The informed AI's guess as to the, as to the value of the potential new knowledge is better than conventional wisdom's guess and the informed AI can use that to its advantage by investing in the potential new knowledge when no one else will. With that, thank you for your attention. These last three slides were full, of course, of speculation, but hopefully stimulating speculation, and I look forward to discussion.